Thank you all for coming out today. I'm Lenny Mendoza. I'm a uh, board member here at New America and also a senior partner at McKinsey. And uh, just excited to help kick off this discussion today that's pretty timely and important about the value and value creation and the usage of open data. Um, it's, it's great to see so many people here today, uh, especially right before the holidays. It's, I think, a combination of the, the reflection of the interest and opportunity in this area, as well as the challenge of how do you actually make this real in the role of government in helping ensure that there is value created. Uh, we have a great set of speakers today that reflect the heart of the issue from different sectors. So we've got folks from the government, the private sector, and the media and NGOs here to talk a little bit about how do we ensure that there is value in open data. And we're going to start with Nick Sinai, who I'll introduce in a moment of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. We'll hear from my colleagues Michael Chewy and Deanna Farrell. And then we're going to turn it over to Alex Howard of O'Reilly Media to introduce the panel and engage a little bit of a discussion with you all to close out the morning. Uh, I'm not going to do a big long windup because we've got a lot of great speakers that are going to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, but I want to do just a couple of thoughts about what you're going to be hearing from them in terms of the key points that we want you to take away. Um, as we all know, including in the headlines today, open data is often talked about in terms of privacy and security, but it goes much beyond that. And the way we want to talk about today is not in those issues, although we obviously touch on them, but we want to talk about how open data creates value through improved decision making, new products and services, and accountability. A government in this is obviously an extraordinarily important stakeholder, plays a vital role as a catalyst, a user, and a regulator. We'll talk through some examples of that, but we want to talk about the role of government in that ecosystem to ensure that there is value that's created from this power of open data. So let me introduce our uh, keynote speaker who's going to give us a, a little bit of a sense of what to think about this. It's my honor to introduce uh, Nick Sinai, who's the Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, he helps lead the President's open data initiatives to liberate data to fuel innovation and growth and helps uh, the federal government be more transparent, participatory, that's a big word, and collaborative. Before that, Nick was in the FCC, and before that, he was also in the private sector before joining the administration at, as a venture capitalist and as an executive and advisor to startup technology companies. So he's got a nice range of experience here, as well as uh, a, a real important role in the government to talk to you today. So my pleasure to introduce Nick. Please join us. Great. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction. It's good to be here today. Uh, as many of you know, um, one of the President's first priorities uh, after taking office was to build a government uh, for the 21st century that has traditionally been in the 20th century. And he believes that this work will help us be more effective, efficient, uh, data-driven, and transparent. And so the topic of, of today's conversation about the value of open data uh, is an excellent example of how we are delivering on this uh, commitment. And as a valuable national asset, uh, government data should be open and available uh, to the public, to entrepreneurs, to scientists, uh, instead of being trapped in government systems. Right? Taxpayers paid for this information. They paid for these vast troves of government data, and wherever possible, should be available to everyone. And at a basic level, the federal government collects or creates a whole uh, range of data uh, from uh, statistical, economic, uh, financial, regulatory, programmatic, research, development, a whole, a whole wide range of data. Um, but many of it's trapped. And even when it's technically available, it's kind of hard to find, uh, uh, hard to understand, and, and hard to reuse. Um, and so over the past few years, the administration has launched a series of open data initiatives uh, in health, energy, education, public safety, global development, finance, uh, to, to open up this data in these areas that for the, f that for the very first time uh, were, were very hard to access. And so recognizing this, the President signed an executive order in May of this year uh, making open and machine readable the new default for government information, uh, directing historic steps uh, to, to open up data. And so under the terms of this executive order and, and uh, related open data policy, 
Uh, newly generated government data is required to be open and machine readable as the default, uh, while continuing to protect privacy and security. And so for all of you who aren't data enthusiasts like us, um, I imagine most people are in this room, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But for those who aren't, let me tell a story uh, um, that I think will, will help illustrate why I'm so excited and why I hope all of you should be so excited as well. So this is a story about Lewis. And Lewis is a farmer in, in Indiana, Columbus, Indiana. He has over 5,000 acres of farmland uh, and he grows blueberries. And there's about a five-day window for Lewis to plant his crop. Sometimes, depending on the weather, uh, he gets rained out. Sometimes he plants and the seeds uh, gets too hot and the seeds die. Um, so a string of bad weather can mean the difference between a successful crop uh, and, and, and severe financial losses. And on the flip side of Lewis is a gentleman named David Friedberg. So in 2006, David was a Google engineer and he was driving on the Embarcadero in San Francisco and he saw a bicycle rental hut and it was raining and he was thinking, you know, how, do, how does a small business uh, that rents bicycles deal with something they can't control, the weather? And so he was inspired to start a company that uses better data and better algorithms to help uh, American businesses with what they can't control, the weather. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so David started this company to offer weather insurance uh, uh, to businesses. Uh, and so this company, Climate Corporation, offers weather insurance uh, that pays farmers when they don't get enough rain uh, and pays out quickly enough so farmers can afford to replant a different crop. And Climate Corporation allows farmers like Lewis to plant higher risk crops like blueberries um, that may not be a good fit for federal crop insurance. And Climate Corp also offers apps and tools to help uh, farmers kind of plan and manage uh, their crops. And the company has over 200 employees today. Uh, they have offices in California and, and also across the Midwest. Uh, and this company wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for government data. Climate Corporation uses uh, historical weather data, forecasts from the National Weather Service, terrain maps and soil types from the U.S. Geological Survey, crop yields from USDA, weather and earth observation from NASA, uh, data from, from across uh, the U.S. federal government. And I, I love hearing stories like this uh, of, of David and Lewis. Uh, it's, it's just uh, a great example of the power of open data and what we're going to hear more about uh, today. Uh, um, and it, this isn't just about farmers. I mean, this is happening across different sectors of the economy. And whether it's, it's small businesses or large businesses, uh, as we'll hear more about today, uh, this is really a, a, broad, a broad theme. I think David's and Lewis's story um, is great because it illustrates three things. First is the federal government, we need to make it easier for entrepreneurs like David. We should make it easy to find and use any government data set, and we need to make it easy uh, for, for, for entrepreneurs to find data that uh, uh, is technically available, but isn't, uh, isn't yet online, right? So that data that could be made public. And so that's something that we are committed uh, to do. Um, secondly, open data um, is, not a, is not an ends unto itself. Data doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't teach your kids, it doesn't improve your health, and, and, and data doesn't uh, help farmers, right? Uh, farmers have had a lot of access to, to data previously. Uh, so data is only useful if you apply it, if you apply it for a customer benefit or, or a public benefit. And so what's truly exciting is, is not, not just what we're doing inside of government, but how the private sector is taking our data and creating all kinds of innovative things. And so whether it's companies, startups, citizens, uh, uh, financial products, software, new comparison engines to help uh, consumers make better decisions, news stories and journalists, breakthrough science, scientific discoveries. There's a whole piece about, about uh, greater scientific discoveries that have actually significant uh, uh, economic impact. Uh, that's what's really exciting, is, 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 this, is this vast cornucopia uh, of innovation across diverse parts of the economy. And I think the, th the third thing that's exciting about um, uh, David's story is, is that uh, we can't always expect, uh, anticipate all of the uses of federal open data. And so I think that's, that's uh, it, it's not like 
uh, NOAA, for example, was thinking about uh, farmers and weather insurance and apps for, for, for farmers when they're, when they're um, thinking about their earth observation systems. And so this, this unanticipated uh, innovation uh, uh, is, is such an important lesson from the story. And Climate Corporation is just one example, right? Uh, so if you take companies like uh, Trulia and Redfin and Zillow, uh, these, are, these are companies helping consumers make important real estate decisions. Uh, and these companies use data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, Census Bureau, but they also mix it up with local data, right? So local crime data, zoning data, tax data. And I think that's what's really exciting is the, the mixture of, uh, of data and then the, the algorithms and the, and the value kind of created on, on top of it. Um, so I'm really excited to see that today a research institution at NYU uh, called GovLab uh, is announcing uh, the beta launch of a project, uh, a list of companies called the Open Data 500. Uh, so they're putting together this list of 500 companies that are powered by open government data. And, and um, so this is kind of a, a broad list of companies. I obviously won't read all 500, uh, but here's, I'll just give you a, a, a two examples from, the, from their list. So one company is a company called Brightscope. Uh, so Brightscope is a startup in San Diego. It's grown to be over 70 folks. Uh, and they provide transparency uh, about 401k plans, uh, about, the, about the performance, the fees, uh, and about registered advisors. So it's help, helping companies make better decisions and helping employees make, make better decisions so they can achieve uh, uh, financial security in their retirement. Another example on the list is a company called Archimedes. So this is a company that spun out of uh, Kaiser Permanente, I think in 2007, and they're making personalized medicine a reality, right? So when you think about medicine uh, and, and uh, doctors kind of giving you a course of action or talking about interventions, what you care about is how this is relevant to you, not kind of the general population. And so uh, there's, a, there's a number of, of great companies that are thinking about this. Archimedes is, is, is one great example of, of thinking uh, not about general guidelines, but about courses of action uh, that are, are individual and relevant to the, to the specific patient. So this list of 500 is fantastic. It's, it's showing uh, how open data uh, uh, is relevant and fueling uh, 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 whole sectors of the economy uh, across different industries. Um, and I think we'll, we'll hear more about that from the McKinsey folks as well here today. The, the other thing is that open data is helping us be more uh, effective in how we work as a government. Uh, and it's also helping uh, uh, Americans benefit as, as a result. So for example, the, the uh, US Health and Human Services released a data set this year uh, for the first time showing what hospitals charge for inpatient uh, 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 stays for the hundred most common kinds of hospital stays, and so it reviewed it, it revealed a massive uh, um, variation of hospital charges even within the same metro area. So in Birmingham, Alabama, for example, the average hospital charge for hip and knee replacement varies from twenty three thousand at one hospital to one hundred forty one thousand at another just a few miles away. And so the demand for this kind of information is real. Uh, within 24 hours of this hospital charge information being made public, it was downloaded over 100,000 times. Uh, making data open and available also means improving services for the public. So when HHS makes a list of healthcare providers or the VA posts a list of regional benefit offices, it helps a startup uh, that's making a, a geolocation app uh, for, for uh, Americans to kind of find these services. Uh, we're also working uh, uh, to, to, put, to make information more standardized so large search engines can find our data as well. Uh, for example, when you search for a, a drug uh, or a prescription in a major search engine, that kind of information comes up immediately. And that's the kind of uh, uh, thing that's going to help Americans. And so while there's a lot, of, a lot more work to do, I'm really excited about the progress being made on the executive order. Let me just tell you a little bit about what what the agencies are, are doing. Uh, so first, agencies are crea creating a single enterprise data inventory. That is, uh, they're required to catalog their data assets in the same way that agencies are required to catalog chairs uh, or tables. Uh, they're required to catalog their data assets across the agency. Uh, two, for those data assets that are public, 
they're required to publish a public data listing on their slash data pages. Uh, you should go check it out. Um, so those are all the data assets that are public or could be made public. And this gets back to this asymmetric information challenge that I was talking about earlier. And third, agencies are adopting new feedback me mechanisms, both online and in person, uh, to help them prioritize kind of which assets they should go after and, and, and make available. So I'm pleased to report that we're making great progress. Over a, do a dozen agencies have launched web pages at agency.gov slash data, making it easier for the public uh, to find and understand and use data. Uh, and that data is both on those pages and it's also harvested into uh, data.gov where all of the uh, US government uh, open data is listed. Uh, agencies are also building important internal processes uh, inside of uh, the agencies um, to, to make data more accessible and, and work on how to improve how we interact with uh, the public. So let me give you some uh, specific examples uh, just across a couple agencies. Uh, I see we have Department of Treas Treasury here, uh, but my first example is actually the Department of Education. So uh, DOE is offering a suite of new application programming interfaces, uh, um, kind of software uh, uh, interfaces for th that allow software developers to, uh, to access great tools and data like a solar energy resource finder, a uh, vehicle gas mileage estimates, and a utility rate database, among others. And they've recently launched the American Energy Data Challenge, uh, uh, asking for the public's help uh, um, in thinking about uh, how to solve America's most pressing uh, energy challenges and, and what's the role of data. Uh, the Department of Transportation has made more than 2,000 data sets publicly available and easily accessible. Uh, that data helps power the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, safer car app that consumers can use to compare safety ratings, locate child safety seat information, and track vehicle recalls. And through the data.gov platform, uh, which initially launched in 2009, the public can, can access tens of thousands of data sets from a wide array of topics, uh, from the hospital charge information to credit card complaints, weather and climate, and so much more. Uh, and to make it easier for, for entrepreneurs, uh, we're working to reimagine data.gov. Uh, so I encourage you to check out next.data.gov. Um, we're actually uh, reimagining data.gov in a very open and transparent way. So we're using open source software, uh, uh, something called WordPress and CCAN, uh, to uh, uh, help build it um, and the guts of it. Uh, it's also open design, so it's on something called GitHub, which is a, uh, Alex knows, knows GitHub well. Uh, so Git, GitHub is, is a place for uh, software developers to, to share code. And so we're making uh, the new data.gov uh, completely open. And so um, uh, local governments or, or, or other governments can, can share, uh, uh, contribute ideas, um, and so forth. And so um, we're still just kind of scratching the surface here. Um, the White House, was, White House also uh, developed Project Open Data, because uh, we want to take the same approach about open, open source software, um, uh, open design, uh, and so Project Open Data, which I encourage you all to Google, is, is not only where we've put our policy, but it's also a free online repository for uh, tools for the agencies. Uh, it has case studies. It has uh, uh, open source software for them to help uh, implement open data. Um, and again, uh, cities, states, foreign governments uh, can learn from us. They can use our designs. They can use our, our, our tools or code. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited uh, to hear from McKinsey today uh, about their report. It's fantastic to see about the, the potential of open data and the value that it can create, the, the uh, over trillion dollars of, of domestic value and three trillion uh, globally uh, across seven key sectors of the economy. Um, and so whether it's, it's, it's new company and new product creation, whether it's uh, kind of increased efficiency of systems or consumer surplus, cost savings, uh, all of these are kind of fantastic uh, ways that we can think about the, the economic value of open data. And I'm sure you'll, you'll hear uh, a ton more about it. One of my, uh, so one of the themes of the, rep of the report uh, and, and one of my, my favorite topics is, is how open data can make markets more transparent. And so the Consumer, fi Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a great example of this, right? So they have something called the Consumer Complaint Database. 
um, and uh, it allows the public to see what consumers are complaining about and why, uh, and when the question in the company in question responds. Consumers can track their own complaints, and regulators can use this, this database to inform their work, and companies can identify pain points, and they're even starting to compete on customer service. There was a recent Forbes article about how large banks are now competing uh, on customer service. Um, the McKinsey report also talks about this notion, kind of a close cousin of open data, this notion of my personal data or my data. Um, and it, this is something uh, that the administration has been working hard to further. Uh, so one example of this is the Blue Button Initiative, which started at the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs uh, to make uh, prescription data available for veterans. And it's grown uh, beyond prescription data to think about more, more than just that and, and all health information. Uh, available back to uh, consumers. And so uh, now across both uh, the VA and TRICARE and other government systems, as well as uh, large insurers and payers and, and other parts of the healthcare system, over 88 million Americans can, can get access to their healthcare information uh, uh, due to the Blue Button Initiative. Um, and so it becomes a powerful catalyst to motivate uh, health providers and health plans to, to, to engage the consumers uh, and lets them put healthcare kind of in their hands. Uh, we've launched my data or personal data initiatives in a number of uh, other sectors. Uh, the Green Button Initiative, for example, uh, gives Americans the ability to, to access and download their own energy usage uh, information. So today, uh, over 42 million households and businesses, uh, reaching over 100 million Americans, uh, have access to their their own green button energy usage data. And if so, if you're shopping for for solar panels, or if you're uh, thinking about uh, virtual energy audits, uh, this kind of thing can help consumers uh, save energy and save on their bills. So, armed with your own personal information, uh, what, if it's sitting in the vaults of government, or if it's uh, or if it's from industry, consumers can, can better understand the medications they're taking, they can understand how much energy their house is using, how their child is doing in school, uh, and in addition to helping consumers make more informed decisions, it's also fuel for, for, for economic growth and the kind of innovation from entrepreneurs and startups creating new apps and services uh, to help in these markets. So stay tuned for additional uh, federal My Data uh, announcements uh, coming in 2014. And so I think regardless of whether we're talking about open data that's available to everyone or whether we're talking about personal uh, 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 my data that's available safely and securely only to you, uh, I think we'll fall short if we're just talking about the supply of data, right? Um, we also have to think about uh, the dialogue with the users of data. And that's why uh, uh, the administration has, has held uh, a number of data jams, these uh, small workshops with innovators and entrepreneurs uh, about the use of the data, and we've held these data paloozas, these larger events to, to celebrate uh, private sector innovation uh, uh, using our data and, and other sources of data uh, to, to kind of advance important uh, national priorities. Uh, so I can't wait to see the new products and services and companies uh, that, that come forth from, from the use of open government data, and I'm really excited about the, uh, about the panel discussion today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks to the New America Foundation for hosting us, and uh, thanks to all of you who are, some of you might be geeks and know what GitHub are, other people uh, also just are interested in the uh, tremendous power of this trend. Uh, my name is Michael Chu. I'm a principal at the McKinsey Global Institute. I lead some of our firm's research on the impact of long-term technology trends, and I was one of the co-leaders, along with Diana, who you'll meet in a moment, of some of our research uh, on this topic of open data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I thought I'd just introduce some of the research findings. Again, it's an extensive report. You can download it off the web. Uh, so uh, you know, if you want to see all the great details, uh, it's it's freely av freely available. But maybe I'd just introduce some of the things that we found as we tried to study what we think is a very uh, important topic. We've actually been looking at the impact of data for several years now. We've led some research on big data, which is just the increasingly complex, voluminous. Uh, real-time and, and diverse types of data which exist. But we actually think this uh, trend about open data and making data more fluid or liquid is actually an incredibly important one. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why. 
Uh, one of the things that what we often point out is that data or the importance of data is not actually new. So um, here's a picture of uh, an important data pioneer. Does anyone recognize who that is? It's Thomas Jefferson, right? Third president of the United States. Uh, he made a real estate deal a few years ago, you know, bought some land, Louisiana Purchase. Uh, after purchasing it, he actually decided to do a, a home inspection or something like that. So he sent a couple of inspectors out there. You might be familiar with these guys. <laughs> Meriwether Lewis, uh, John Clark, uh, and, and, went and, and instructed them in, through some orders, because uh, uh, they, they were members of the military, uh, to go and inspect this land. And it's a, it's a pretty interesting order. You can read it, actually, on, on the web. He didn't issue it on the web, I don't think. But um, you know, he asked them to look at the flora, the fauna. He asked them to look at the rivers, the streams, the lakes. He wanted to know everything he could about them. And he ex instructed them to, to record it in great detail. But, you know, right after that is something pretty interesting. He says, and recorded in great detail, both for yourselves as well as others. And I think that second part is an incredibly important realization, which is that as much data as one organization can collect and use, and we think that most organizations, governments included, can usually capture a tremendous amount more from the value of the data that they already have, that, that value gets multiplied when more and more people can use it. So I think Jefferson was aware, as aware of it before, uh, as, as modern day people are now, such as Nick. But now that we're collecting so much more data, we can create so much more value. And that's really what we wanted to, uh, to investigate. So here, just a, a few you know, st stats and statistics, et cetera. You, you know, you're free to read them. But one of the things that we've noted is, you know, since Jefferson's time, this idea of governments particularly, but other institutions making data more available, more open, more liquid, uh, is one that's you know, spanning the world, so not only the U.S. national government, but different levels of government, from municipal to state, uh, also you know, large-scale large multinational organizations, uh, as well as around the world. Right? So we, we see you know, over 40 uh, governments around the world who have some sort of open data portal. Now, one of the things that, that we're going to illustrate is that we think of open data as really being defined along several spectra. Um, you, know, you, can be, you can take a very uh, narrow view of open data, uh, which is you know, ex represented on the left-hand side of this, of this chart, or you can, you can take a more expansive view. And we tried to take a slightly more expansive view. So those four criteria are as follows. First, how many people have access to the data? You can, you can, you know, the most closed data, only one person or one organization has access to it. And the most open data is everyone in the world or everyone on the internet has access to it. But we think there's a bit of a spectrum there, and it's important to, to recognize that spectrum. So take even some of the data that has been made available in healthcare to, from health and human services. Um, you know, a lot of that data was just kept completely proprietary to that agency. And, you know, through Todd Parks and others' efforts over the years, more and more of that data has been made open or available. But not necessarily completely open. Not all of it's completely open. For some of it, you have to be a qualified medical researcher. But we still think that bringing that data outside the walls of government actually increases its value. So again, that's one spectrum uh, against which you can view the openness of data. Secondly, you can look at the, the degree to which data is machine readable. So you know, data which is increasingly machine readable, easier for ma machines to use, actually becomes more valuable. It becomes easier to use. You know, so some data has been released, released in proprietary data formats, which you know, arguably are still on the web, and yet not quite as easy to use, whereas other data can easily be extracted, turned into a database, combined with other data, et cetera. So machine readability is important. Cost is also important. Some, some data is completely free or, or inexpensive, free of cost. Uh, other data is extremely expensive. Again, that varies along the spectrum. And then finally, the legal rights or the negotiated rights to reuse, analyze, republish data. Again, some data you have completely unrestricted rights to use it. Some data you have absolutely no rights to use it. Again, that's a spectrum. We just, but we do find that as data is increasingly open, can be used by more and more people, it can be, create more and more value. And one of the things that we wanted to do is try to understand how that value gets created. Before we go there, though, it's helpful to just understand in the scope of data, you know, Nick already made a little bit of reference to this, how we view all the different types of data um, you know, lying, right? So first of all, there's all the data in the world. And there's what we've described as big data. Now, big data is not just voluminous data, right? But we've described it, and others have described it as a trend where it's increasingly divor uh, diverse in its sources and types, where it comes from, uh, whether or not it's structured or unstructured data, whether or not it's images or video, et cetera. And then the fact that data is becoming increasingly real time. Uh, you want to be able to deal with it and, uh, with great currency. So that's, that's this trend we call big data. Now, 
a lot of what we've described as open data, this increasingly liquid data from the criteria we just showed pr previously, a lot of that actually is going to be big data, but some of it will actually not be big data, but increasingly open as well. Small parts, amounts of data might also be open. And then within open data, there's the data that's being released by governments. Uh, and we think that's an incredibly important place. We do think that governments are, in many cases, leaders in creating, collecting, and distributing open data. But we do think other organizations are also able to, able to make their, their data open. And finally, there's another category, which uh, Nick also made reference to. Uh, we've used the term my data. Other people use other terms. But that's when an organization makes data available to the people or organizations that it collected it from. That has some really important advantages. Uh, in many cases, it's just a transparency advantage. It's, it's of great value for me to know what an organization has uh, when an organization has data about me. But the organization can also benefit as well because many times when you release open data to the person for whom it's uh, valuable, uh, you also give them the ability to correct it or add to it. And so that actually increases the value of that data to the organization. So it's, it's actually a, a benefit that flows both ways. So that being said, what did we do? Well, we tried to understand in uh, a number of different domains in the economy. And we tried to lo look at some of these as being social se sector domains. We looked at some of these being B2B, some of them being B2C. So we have education, we have transportation, consumer products, we have electricity and oil and gas. We also looked uh, and, and leveraged some of our previous work on uh, the impact of increasingly liquid data in the U.S. healthcare system. And then portion of, portions of consumer finance, which include retail banking, uh, insurance, um, uh, and as well as you know, some aspects of, of home finance and, and, and real estate. And when we looked across all of these different domains in, in the economy, and we, we had a global uh, uh, scope, uh, with the exception of healthcare, we, where we looked just at the United States, uh, on an annual run rate basis, we found that increasingly open or liquid data could create over $3 trillion of value annually. Now, what's interesting is we viewed this not only as value that's created in terms of uh, profit, the profits to companies, uh, new companies, or the ability for existing companies to increase their efficiency and effectiveness of operations. But we also looked at the value that consumers and individual citizens can derive. So take, for example, price transparency. Nick mentioned the fact that having more open data actually makes markets more transparent. Well, sometimes that value is actually going to accrue to the consumer, perhaps through price transparency, where someone's able to you know, buy something at the best possible price. Well, that benefit doesn't necessarily, uh, is not necessarily captured in a traditional GDP metric. And yet it's still value that actually gets captured by consumers. And we thought it was important to capture that as well. Um, so it, w when we looked across all of these different domains, a tremendous amount of value uh, can be created. Uh, and again, it's, it's in some cases improving the businesses of existing businesses, improving the performance of existing businesses. Sometimes it's creating new businesses, uh, new lines of business that are based on data. Uh, and then sometimes it's actually you know, value that gets captured by individuals. So let, let me just give a, a, a couple of examples of where we found this value being created. So take the uh, education field, for instance. Uh, there, we found five different ways in which increasingly open or liquid data can actually create value. Firstly, in improved instruction. When you actually have a, a, a large body of information about, for instance, uh, if, you know, we're seeing this online, for instance. We're seeing a lot of more online different types of uh, uh, courses being placed. And one of the things you do when you create uh, a way for a path, different pathways, you can actually start to analyze the data and figure out if someone takes trigonometry first or algebra first, uh, are they more successful in, uh, in calculus? Are they more successful in, in statistics? Being able to pool that data from multiple sources because it becomes more open allows us to improve instruction. That's just one way that that can happen. Secondly, matching students to programs. Actually, n f having a, a student be able to tell which program is most appropriate for them, again, it can be that, that ability, it's a, it's a type of uh, market matching, as Nick described it, uh, can also be enabled by more data being made available about educational institutions, about uh, educational outcomes, and then uh, and about students themselves. Similarly, matching students to employment. This is some work that uh, my colleagues at McKinsey have looked at, which is you know, education to employment. There's a tremendous mismatch many times between the skills and the jobs that are available in the marketplace, and more importantly, that will be available in the marketplace going forward, uh, and the educational programs that students would be best suited to take in order to make sure that they can match uh, the needs that are in the marketplace. Again, being able to provide more transparency, more information, and more data about the, the 
opportunities that will be there and the skills that are necessary, along with the programs that can be used to get there, are extremely valuable. And then paying for education similarly, uh, much the way that Brightscope can provide, does provide a tremendous amount of information to an individual uh, consumer in terms of what they can do to enhance their financial outcomes, being able to pay for education as well as another place where open data can be uh, made available. And then finally, efficient system administration. The school systems themselves, for example, just in procurement, the ability to understand how much other institutions are paying for certain goods and services uh, is, a, is a fundamental and straightforward way to improve their efficiency. In fact, what we found, if you look across all of the $3 trillion in annual value, about a third of that comes through better benchmarking, just having transparency into uh, how others with similar uh, characteristics are either paying for things or in the healthcare case uh, how people are dealing with their health care. So again if you look across all those five levers uh, we see on the neighborhood of about a trillion dollars per year annually uh, in value that can be unlocked in education. Let me just give one other example which is in consumer products just to you know take us in a completely different direction. Again another five levers one of them is simply improving uh, product design and manufacturing. If you have more information for instance about what people are actually using products for you can actually design better products, to, products that are more fit for purpose uh, for individual consumers. You can also, also improve store operations if you have more information, uh, both about the consumers as well as what's going on in the, star, in the store. More, more targeted marketing and sales. Uh, again, census information has been used for many years in order to target better. But when you actually have more data becoming mo more available and open, uh, you can use that to understand what uh, uh, individual consumers' needs are. And then better informed consumption. The first three really you know, improve uh, outcomes for companies. But this third one's incredibly important as well. If you actually give people more information, sometimes through a mobile app, which comes through machine-readable data, you know, number one, you could actually have a lot more price transparency, and we're starting to see that already, where someone can actually tell how much does this item cost in multiple stores. But you can actually imagine turning that around, where a company might make more information available about its consumer products say, you know, what types of materials are in that product, or whether or not child labor was used in the production of that product, or where it comes from. Again, you can imagine people actually paying more for products because it, they have that information. So I think this, you know, pr providing more information about products to consumers is another potential value for open data where the consumer uh, and the producer can benefit. And then finally, improving post-sales interactions. Again, if you know more about how people are using products, you can actually improve the customer service and compete on the basis of customer service as well. Again, another tremendous amount of value can be captured uh, through open data, even in the consumer products uh, area. So if you want to take a look, we, we, we go through a number of different areas in which open data, more increasingly uh, shared data, can be used both by companies as well as individuals and consumers to increase their value. Again, we think that uh, accountability, transparency, all those things that we've talked about in terms of good government, good institutional governance is incredibly important. What we think we're adding to the debate is the, the value of th these types, this type of data actually to create real economic value. Let me turn it over at this point to my uh, colleague, Diana, to talk a little bit about the role of government. And, and thank you again to the New America Foundation for having us here. Um, I think what, what, what Michael has shared with us so far is the results of the report you'll see outside. Painstaking detail, uh, domain by domain, to try and understand this critical dimension of open data, how much value can be unlocked. But of course, the value will be both created and captured by the full range of stakeholders in society. And we see, of course, consumers who will be uh, not only beneficiaries through price transparency, through more convenience, through better services, but also. It, they must be users, they must be informed users of the data. We see also businesses will be able to capture a lot of this value through the introduction of new products and services, but they also need to participate in the process of um, making data available, processing the data, cleaning the data, et cetera, et cetera. So too the media has a critical role to play in informing uh, society, individual stakeholders, and otherwise about how this data is being used, misused, what is missing in the debate, and of course NGOs who will harness the power of open data for their own causes, but also need to be part of the watchdogs and infrastructure for how this evolves over time. Now as we think about all these stakeholders, they interface very importantly with the government, and we do come back to the discussion 
that is very apropos for DC about how critical it is for government to help be a catalyst in its own release of data, to help uh, foster the right kind of discussion and the right kind of dialogue around these issues. And, you know, Michael ended on a note that I think we come back to all the time that too, um, too much the open data conversation has been uh, narrowly cast as a transparency and, and good government, good efficiency discussion. Uh, we think that's very important. We're big fans of that, but we think it's a much bigger conversation around value creation, uh, but with the adequate uh, measures of risk and, 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 and oversight. Now, if you, um, if you think about what those elements are, uh, that government uh, needs to play a central role in. One is enabling these value levers to actually come about and, and become uh, uh, able to deliver on the promise of the many examples that, that Michael gave you in the two domains that he touched about. We have all seven domains uh, referenced in the, in the report itself. Um, but very importantly, we think government has a critical role to play in managing the risks associated with open data because there are real risks, but also because so long as the these risks as are perceived risks. There will be lots of resistance and barriers to people adopting all this. And we think government has a critical role in convening the stakeholders and helping enable the ecosystem from developing. And so when I think about what Todd and Nick have done, um, US, uh, the government has done to bring together these data paloozas, to bring together the sets of interested parties, that's a critical part because without the ecosystem of software providers, without the ecosystem of um, businesses and consumers actively demanding this, this is just data sitting on computers, it won't mean anything at all. Um, now, if you think about all the seven domains that we've looked at, education, transportation, energy, healthcare, consumer finance, consumer products, and we've specified the levers at a great level of detail, but you can take a lens back out and say there are really three categories of um, ways in which open data is ultimately enabling value creation. One is improving decision making across the board. And so whether it's better decisions about students going to schools, better instruction, better consumer decisions, et cetera, we think the promise of open data is a lot. And, and if you think about government in helping enable that better decision making, it, it's both through the promotion of a wide release of data through helping real-time performance examination uh, using this data and, and being on the forefront of some of the computers that allow analysis of this analysis of this data. And you know whether it's NOAA or whether it's Census or whether it's many of the organizations within government that are driving these, I think uh, government has a critical role to help enable the ecosystem that will make better decisions and create value that way. Of course, um, a lot of the value comes from all kinds of new offerings, new products, new services, um, more uh, efficient products and services. And we think government has a role here too in helping spark innovation, either by bringing the right folks together or by uh, prizes and things like that that the government has already initiated uh, successfully, uh, by helping um, through its own data, individuals, businesses, or otherwise, better segment populations and allow more customized solutions by good regulation that fosters competitiveness as these innovations occur and by ensuring the supply meets demand in all the ways that supply and demand often get mismatched in markets. Um, finally, a critical way that value gets created across all these domains is just improving accountability either accountability for, of markets or accountability of um, decisions. And, um, and here, government has a role to play in increasing transparency, in providing good performance benchmarks, and actively involving citizens and consumers in the solution process. Um, and so as we think about all these domains, we think about all these value creation levers, we do see a critical role for all stakeholders and government as a big enabler of all that value creation. Now, of course, as, as much as you hear our enthusiasm on this, where you come at this wide open with the risks, and we think here, too, um, all stakeholders have a stake in managing these risks, as does government. But just to list some of them and help with this group of people who are interested start a more 
integrated and comprehensive discussion and dialogue on these things that we think are going to be essential to manage in order to unlock this enormous value we have documented. Think about the kind of consumer risks people worry about. Uh, on top of the list is the privacy issues. Certainly in healthcare, this has been an ongoing uh, discussion uh, with the NSA findings. This is the top of uh, every newspaper discussion. And this is really across the whole range of you know, who and which data should be collected, who and which data should be used, what do we do when data is misused, who monitors all that, and those issues and that framework for understanding privacy is going to be essential to unlocking a lot of this value. So too security. All, many organizations, the government, but also private and otherwise, are really struggling with uh, protecting their data and ensuring the, the proper uh, safeguards are in place. And here, too, government has a role in establishing those frameworks. Society has a role in debating how we think about uh, the costs and benefits of ensuring that kind of security. And ultimately, there are a set of issues around safety, some real, some perceived. And so people are concerned that if um, certain data is made available and people it's incorrect, they could make decisions that lead to poor safety outcomes. Who's going to be liable on those issues? How do we ensure that the quality of the data leads to uh, the best safety? Uh, these are the kinds of consumer risks we hear a lot about, and they're, they're very prominent in the press. But there, there are two, a number of business risks that are part of this story. Um, Transparency. A lot of organizations limit the amount of data they make available because they think it may reveal excess information. Teachers take real issue with a lot of data being put out there because they think it may cast poorly on their performance in ways that concern them. Hospitals have real concerns about this. Uh, how we deal with those transparency issues and how we provide safeguards to the next issue around liability for what this data shows and to whom are parts of the framework that will be essential to enabling the value. And then there's some interesting issues that we think could arise over time around intellectual property that have to do with, um, if you think about the story of patent reform uh, or, or the, the, the recent patents on, on genes, for example, for a while the U.S. Patent Office was actually allowing people to patent genes because it was so difficult to identify genes. And now that we've had an entire public infrastructure to, um, to identify genes, we've overruled that. We no longer allow that kind of intellectual property to be harnessed. Uh, we are likely to see issues like that arise as more and more data become available and we think about who owns the rights around that. Uh, of course, there are all kinds of mitigation strategies, but a critical debate in society around how we think about these risks, what the costs and benefits are going to be essential for us to properly identify or de-identify information, if you like, to invest in the right safeguards and training and to ensure that all stakeholders feel like they have a voice and are heard appropriately. Um, as we um, complete this discussion of sort of government's role, of course, many of the things I've mentioned is government as a regulator, as a rule maker, and, and that's important uh, because government will be essential to establish a lot of these standards, both in the actions it takes uh, and the parameters it sets out there, of course, enforcing a lot of those standards one way or the other. But a very big part of this is government as a user itself, both releasing its own data, applying its own analytics, improving programs, and putting them out in the public domain. And I, we think very importantly as a catalyst through some of the things that the government has been doing here and many other countries today, convening stakeholders, ensuring educated uh, users, and actually investing in a lot of these programs. Um, if these roles are taken seriously and we have a public debate <laughs> that is sophisticated and invo involves all stakeholders, we are very excited about the economic value that can be created here. So um, I want to thank you for the time and for your interest. We think this is a very exciting topic. And to begin that kind of public dialogue, I have the pleasure of introducing Alex Howard, who's going to lead our panel today. And as many of you know, um, Alex Howard is the Government 2.0 Washington correspondent for, no? no. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, I was given the wrong note, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. And I apologize for that, but um, thank you very much for leading our panel. Um, 
This is a really interesting moment to be having this discussion in Washington because I think that uh, hopefully the people who are tuning in here are, uh, are connected to each other um, and also connected to the people who we'll be bringing up. Um, we've got uh, Mike Flowers, uh, I believe somewhere in the audience here, um, who is from uh, New York City. Um, and uh, I believe it holds the uh, distinction of being the first um, chief analytics officer for uh, Gotham City. And he, so he is, uh, I think, one of the best people situated to speak about uh, the internal value of open data in terms of applying analytics to get insights. We've got someone from Zillow, and of course I'm missing my program, so I don't have the proper introduction for her. Um, go. Yes, please, please join us up here. Um, let's see, uh, Svenja Goodell, is that about right? The Director of Economic Research at Zillow. And of course, if you're interested in buying uh, property, Zillow is a very important uh, area. We've got Sasha Meinrath, the uh, home team here, uh, Vice President of New America and Director of the Open Technology Institute. And me. So I, I'm, I guess I'm the uh, odd duck here. So there's a, uh, I think, uh, an opportunity right off the bat um, for each of you to speak about uh, what uh, you understood or took away from what we just saw in terms of uh, your own experience with open data. What did you see there that relates to what you do professionally um, in terms of uh, how you value or consume or create data? I'll sure, start with you. Me Please. Jump right in. Yes. Um, so pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I, you know, I, I thought all the points that were made were incredibly good ones. Uh, I think uh, it's about time that we really take a deeper look at, at open data, big data. I think those terms float around a whole lot, and people don't always know what to make with them, but uh, make of them. But I think we all interact with big data and open data on a on a daily basis. And um, in my job, I, I certainly deal with it a whole lot. At Zillow, uh, open data is really at the the core of what we do as a, as a business. And uh, we, we truly believe that uh, you, know, you have to bring transparency to a marketplace, which is exactly what we did. If you think about you know, uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, how you bought real estate was you called up a real estate agent and said, hey, can you show me a couple of homes? And how do you shop real estate today? You go to Zillow, hopefully, or uh, Trulia, or any other web page out there, and you search for your homes, and you do it yourself. And then you contact a real estate agent, and you say, I want you to show me these five homes that I already found. So it's it's a complete uh, difference in how we and and how we deal with buying real estate. And that's just one example about how open data changed our lives, right? And uh, and at Zillow, we use uh, local government data. Uh, so we we import. Um, uh, facts about homes from from all the counties and that's certainly open data but we also deal with open government data so um, I lead our economic research team and we put out research reports all the time that uh, use Humda data or uh, census data or uh, FHFA data in uh, in connection with our own data so we uh, a lot of times morph the data together to produce uh, new insights and, and help customers understand the marketplace and that really brings me to the last point that I quickly wanted to make I thought Nick had an excellent point about data by itself doesn't give you all that much right because if you um, if you think about how much data is floating around out there uh, you know, sometimes people don't know what to do with it. So it's super important to take that data and, and move it forward and actually interpret and, and create knowledge with that data that then consumers can, can absorb and, and use to make better decisions and, and create that transparency in a marketplace. So I take a, a brief station programming note and invite Aman Bandari up. Uh, Aman is the U.S. Director of HIT Data Innovation Strategy at Merck. Um, I first became aware of his work when he was working for the United States government, working with Todd Park on the Blue Button and other open data initiatives at HHS. So thank you, Aman. I wasn't quite sure if you were here, but now I'm glad to see that you are. Um, and for those that don't know, I did leave O'Reilly Media in uh, May of this year, and I'm now a fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, where I do research on data-driven journalism and um, try to speak up for that uh, fourth pillar that Deanna spoke to in terms of the media's role. And I'd actually add on top of it, not just to hold governments accountable for what data is being released, but actually consume it. I think that is a crucial role for media in this age for people who aren't watching what organizations like Bloomberg or Reuters, the Economist Intelligence Unit, or this uh, uh, kind of growing wealth of startups. Uh, they're all uh, consuming and creating a huge economic value out of uh, open data. And in many cases, they're actually creating it themselves now. 
uh, which is a really fascinating emergence. So I wanted to put in my props uh, for that work and also identify myself um, as a fellow. So with that said, move it over to you, Mike. Can you want to field that question as well? Do you still remember the, what I threw out there? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Uh, good to see you again, Alex. You too. Um, so, I mean, a lot of what was said is sort of implicit in everything we do in New York City, except we just don't express it, right? Um, or I don't do it very well anyway. But uh, So I'm an open data practitioner at CORE. I am the chief analytics officer. It's a title I didn't pick, but uh, and it certainly didn't result in any raises. But the, w where we started out was how can we take the information we have and do something with it to make us better? Uh, and by us, it's local government. We pick up your trash. We fight crime. We get sent ambulances to your house. We regulate your businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things that were discussed – resonate with everything we do. Data is bricks from which we build things, right? Data itself, it's data, you know, I mean, and good for you for putting it out. But the reality is I need to know how to take that information, stick it together with something else, and then turn it into something that we can allocate taxpayer resources towards or more effectively, right? So that, that absolutely resonated. The other thing that really resonated with me was and, and something that I think wasn't really deeply discussed, but at core is what I care most about in my job, which is the internal transparency, right? And, and I think some of these terms are becoming, by repeated usage, terms of art. But transparency just simply means people sharing information with one another. And the thing about government that people always seem to get dinged up about is they think it's, some, it, they think it's just a single actor. And that's so not true. And, and, and I don't say this as an advocate for government. I say this as someone who is deeply frustrated <laughs> by the fact that that's not true. I would love an authoritarian state <laughs> only for the, for the ability to get, grab everybody's data. Everything else, we stay with democracy. But, but if I could be, you know, if I had a wish, it would be to be able to just by fiat grab what I wanted to grab to do something with it by, in each agency. It doesn't work that way. Right? Every, and, and it certainly doesn't work that way at the local level, right? Yeah, the guys in Fort Meade might disagree on some of the parts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they may, right? But like, you know, the, the sanitation department does what it does. It picks up trash, and it does it extremely effectively. Um, the police department does what it does extremely effectively, all the controversies notwithstanding. At the end of the day, they get measured by how many people get murdered in New York City, and that number plummeted, right? Um, the fire department, you know, the fire department deals with 20 some odd hundred uh, fires a year and only, and I say this only, I know it matters that the, that number is what it is, but 80 people roughly die every year in a million buildings and 2,500 fires, right, through fire. That's awesome, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, we can get better and more efficient. It's just if we share what the police department knows with the fire department so that the fire department knows how to do their, their preventative or prophylactic inspections, then we get better. Right? Same goes to the, if the sanitation. It turns out that if, you know, there's a lot of debris in front of a place and the sanitation department writes, you know, citations for that, um, that actually is fairly predictive for whether or not bad things are going to happen at that location, or it's at least correlative with. And again, I think it's very commonsensical. So, you know, to, to kind of wrap this up, and the, what I love about this movement, if you can call it a movement, is... It enables operations people to finally live the dream of understanding what it is we know about our subject matter areas or our problems or our challenges and then address them, right? All the other stuff, that's great. I'm not an academic. My wife is. She can write papers on it and have fun. But the, what, what I want to do is deliver widgets. I'm an operations junkie at core, and I really love understanding how we send trash trucks out. I love that stuff. That's fascinating. And the more I can know about how we do that, and the more I can leverage that on behalf of other stuff we do, right? So at core, what I love about the open data concept, the movement itself, is that it enables us to actually get better in terms of servicing, you know, the citizenry. And I would hold just, you know, I know you're booting me, but the, I, I, I would say that those principles apply to any large organization, right? You know, stove piping and silos and all that stuff, it's not endemic to government. It's endemic to any organization that's larger than eight people. And so the more we can leverage the information we have 
internally as an entity, the better off at the end of the day we're all going to be. Thank you very much, Mike. Sorry. Uh, now, <laughs> I know you can take it, so I'm going to ask you a hard question to follow up once we get through these other gentlemen here. But um, New York City is not releasing its crime data, right? So that let's coming, let's come back to that article. one. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, this this is this is a crucial issue. You know, speaking about this particular problem of uh, government releasing an interface, this crime map, which City Council said they needed to do, but not releasing the underlying data for it. So if we're going to talk about open data in New York and using the power of data to do these things, I think that's ground zero. So we'll come back to that. Um, and maybe you can discuss the differences between where you sit in the mayor's office versus where and YPD sits and what they are able to do. Um, so you mentioned open data being a movement. This is actually a great, I think, moment to acknowledge that there are a lot of different stakeholders who are interested in releases of, of data, and they may have different political aims, too. I don't think there's any uh, question that people in this institution, in this room, certainly many people watching online, understand that collecting and releasing data is profoundly political now. Whose data gets collected? How does it get depicted? What are the quality issues in it? Does collection get shut down if the data shows something that's uncomfortable, right? If a law comes through that says you've got to publish this data, then do political actors say, well, let's stop collecting it? Or let's obfuscate it, or let's release it in a format that you can only use if you have a proprietary program? Or let's set a high cost for it? If you look around the world, you can see governments reacting to this new kind of openness with all kinds of, well, uh, fear, right? Or anger or rage because they're being shown to be something that they're saying they're not in public. It's very difficult in these contexts now to have there be a difference between what you say to the people and what the data shows you actually do. Um, that is one of the promises of the moment. Um, and it is also one of the reasons that you have people who are small government libertarians and conservatives support open data and also people who are maybe on the progressive or liberal side. They both want the same releases. One of them wants to make government work better, while the other wants to shrink government because it shows that government is incompetent. But that means you might have alignment with very different kinds of ideologies in the same room. They might even be here. So um, Sasha, you understand data is political. OTI sure does. Can you speak about what you saw here and kind of add some context for your work? Sure. So New America spans a number of different programs, many of which are collecting and making available open data. So you have everything from the education program, which is collecting huge amounts of information, uh, not, the new, not just the U.S. News and World Reports kind of info, but in-depth info around schooling and the outcomes thereof and different options that people might want to look at. You've got folks like Peter Bergen that's collecting information on things like drone strikes and making available the world's foremost open data set on what's happening in terms of where drone strikes are happening, what the outcomes are, who's being killed, etc. For my part, the Open Technology Institute, we have something called Measurement Lab which is now the world's largest plat open platform for collecting broadband data. We put it under a Creative Commons zero license, i.e. you can do anything you want with these data. It's about as open as open can be. That's the utopian kind of future, where smart people collect useful information, make it publicly available, do analysis, and open it up for everyone to 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 work on themselves, to test the hypotheses, to, to redo the analyses, et cetera. I think what we're living through is a shift where for a moment in time, people thought open data was going to solve problems. And people in power didn't realize open data could prove a political problem. And now what we're seeing is a re-enclosure. It's the release of either unusable data. You know, it's like, we'll give you all these data in scanned in PDFs. We call that FOPEN data. FOPEN data. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and then you've also got this thing of, you've got lots of usable data. It's usable, but it's not useful data. It's like 90,000 data sets, a few of which are really insightful but most of which are totally innocuous for doing any sort of meaningful questioning of hypotheses that are being purveyed by people in power, right? That we need X to do Y. We're like, well, is that actually true? We can't test that because they don't make the useful data sets available. And so I, I see the differentiator, exactly what you said. It's about the innocuous versus disruptive data. 
And what we have is a lot of innocuous data that's being publicly released and very little disruptive data. But even if we could get to the disruptive data sets being released publicly, I think there's another fundamental problem, which is where does the locus of control reside in all of these data collection? And we're seeing this right now with NSA surveillance. But we're also going to be seeing this increasingly in the Internet of Things, as smart devices permeate into every facet of your life. It begs the question, should cars report when you're speeding or illegally standing or parked? Should your fridge report to your insurance company your guilty pleasures that we're all engaged in and probably should jack up our insurance rates, but we would rather not have that be known? Should the smart devices in our home inform child protective services when you leave your kid unsupervised in the kitchen while you go to the restroom? And fundamentally what this comes down to is right now you all have zero control over the data that's being collected. And that data is being commoditized and sold from advertisers, from devices, etc. Again, you have no control over this. And what we're seeing right now today is a further dystopian element of this, which is that your privacy has been commoditized and it can now be sold back to you. So just this past week, we saw AT&T declaring that, look, if you pay us $30 more a month, we won't monitor you. So that's a market value for privacy. It's, uh, it's $350 a year is apparently the price tag they've put on that facet of your privacy. This is unwinnable, of course. Right now it's AT&T. Tomorrow will be AT&T plus Staples. The day after that will be somebody else. You cannot win that mechanism, and that is absolutely the trajectory we're on. So I, I view open data as utopian and beautiful in many facets but without privacy protections, consumer safeguards, an adequate understanding of the tension that it makes available, could become a horrendously authoritarian, panoptic state where you have little control over any facet of your privacy. You've been reading the critics. <laughs> so uh, this is not a, a, an abstract thing, of course. Uh, if you're watching uh, where some of these technologies are taking us, you know that, say, insurers for cars um, might say, if you carry around this monitor in your car for a month and then give us the data from it, we'll give you a break on in your insurance. That's already happening. You can look it up in the New York Times, right? So that one example can be extrapolated in all these other directions. Now, while I wouldn't be particularly happy about my smart fridge, you know, emailing Aetna about uh, the fact I'm having Chunky Monkey at 2 a.m. in the morning again and again and again. I'm not doing that, by the way. Um, uh, then, uh, you know, have to think about what open data means in that context. Um, there's no question that, it, that this is really difficult, though, and I think you, you spoke to innocuous data sets. Well, let's be fair. <clears throat> Some organizations have actually released less innocuous data sets. I think one of the most important of those in this town is the, health, the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, uh, back in 2010, when they tried to start really pushing on this, um, they did start with less uh, uh, fraught ones about uh, community health indicators. That's, that was the beginning of it. Now, however, there's more significant data coming online, and Nick spoke to that. Um, Aman, you were part of that from the very beginning. Um, and so I know you understand, you're at Merck now. And if you want to speak about what Merck's doing in this space, that's, that'd be great. But I'd also like to hear a bit more about this issue of shaking loose data, which actually um, does have real juice to it in terms of comparing hospitals, comparing the cost of prices between hospitals that has now been put up on the web. Yeah, so, you know, I'll just speak, you know, kind of on behalf of, I don't represent Merck, but on behalf of, you know, myself and the work that I do and the, and the team that, that I help run um, and, you know, some of my previous work. And I'll take a different angle to some of this, you know, based upon, you know, where I started um, with open data. Actually, it was 1999 when I, when I first started working at the VA, and we used um, data from other government agencies to actually cost out every single VA visit and the algorithms that were already available to us. Because at the VA, you didn't know what anything cost. And so, you know, as I think, you know, Michael Chewy said, this has got a very, very long history here. And I think now, all of a sudden, we've got this, you know, turbocharging effort that's been taking, you know, taking place for quite some time. And I think it's even more significant in the healthcare context, given what's happened with health reform and the High Tech Act. And so the way in which I think about it is, you know, very similar to, you know, some of the comments already made. But something that I'm seeing now 
when I you know wear a private sector hat is um, you know I probably evaluate you know or get to see probably hundreds of of companies a year that are focused on health data, and the vast majority of them, um, in some form or fashion, do use publicly available data. There are very few that are based just on publicly available data, but there are some. And I think the incredible thing to witness, you know, is you know first uh, that there is this you know, um, you know, very pervasive use of data coming from many, many open sources that you may just not be aware of, but it's there. And the smartest companies that I see are integrating that into their platforms, and they understand that in the current business context. And so there are a couple companies out there, for example, one that, that I, I, you know, that I, I like a lot in terms of what they're doing is a company called Roadmap. They're one of the first companies that I've seen that is using primarily openly publicly available data to understand what the marketplace dynamics are going on with healthcare in this country right now. Um, incredible company. And then there are many others that are more on the social good side, like Direct Relief, that are using the data um, to help them with their supply chain efforts in disaster or humanitarian type situations. And so that's on the, on the one side. I think the smartest companies are using this as a competitive advantage, and they're, that's part of their secret sauce is built in. On the other side, you know, what gets me really excited and what I'm really interested in is the, the data that's out there is becoming a tool for collaboration for us and for others. And what I mean by that is in, you know, in healthcare in particular, um, the science of using data is um, is is very um, has, is very staid and very old. If you look at health, the healthcare system, um, and you go talk to a health economist, or or if you go talk to a health services researcher, or you go to talk to somebody who, who's doing that kind of health policy work, and you ask them what has been the fundamental change in how you do your work over the last twenty years, and I guarantee you'll get virtually no answer, because they're using the same methods that they were using 20 years ago. And what I'm seeing now with some of this data being made available from the government is that all of a sudden you've got this flood of new talent, new methods coming into the space that didn't exist before from people who come from totally different backgrounds. And there are concrete examples of this happening. And so for us, you know, what I do to my day-to-day -day job is this is helping us accelerate um, looking at the science of how we do our work. So bringing in, you know, engineers, computer scientists, thinking about bringing machine learning methods to healthcare services that have not, hasn't really existed at scale before. And so I think, you know, the things that we really focus on, we care about is actually the ecosystem around the data, and that includes the talent piece of this, and that means also speeding up research and maybe doing some of that work faster and cheaper because now this data is more openly available. So I can, I can give more concrete examples of that, but that's a little bit of a different take, I think, than from the data itself, but as, you know, what, what is happening outside of that data and who's coming in to look at that and how is that affecting, you know, at least in healthcare, you know, what's happening there. And that's, I think there's some really disruptive forces that are coming into play um, that, that are happening right now. So let me bounce that right back. Uh, I, I list of, of questions, but I'm going to kind of riff on what you're saying because I think that gets us into a more interesting dialogue. And if you all want to ask questions of each other, you know, have at it. We'd like to ask questions of you, actually. Uh, <laughs> that's fine too. You may not get good answers. Uh, the um, this question of disruption, maybe the most in, you know innovative word of 2013. <laughs> Um, which is to say it's been overused, uh, is actually relevant when it comes to existing industries, particularly around uh, scarcity of information. Right? Now, people who follow this space know that there have been repackagers of government data selling that information for decades in D.C. That is part of the context for this discussion, is that if some of these data sets that have real value are released in an open way, there will actually be businesses that are disrupted by it not just in terms of their business practices as the regulators get more information putting out into the markets they operate within, but actually in terms of their business models. If your job is to buy data, clean it up and sell it, and government is actually doing that itself, what happens to your business? Now this is something that you see and many of the entrepreneurs are quite aware of, right? What happens if that gets disrupted? Now, similarly, um, what happens if you build a business upon a data set that gets taken offline because the people it describe are disrupted by it? Now, I'm thinking of doctors and a Medicare claims database. Doctors or, um, uh, say, fraud, right? What happens if you put that online? Now, looking back to your government service, um, where were there instances where you shared data that then the people it described came back and pushed back on? Is there a, a, was there an actual power dynamic that was disrupted by the release of it? You, you know, I, I mean, I, I leave that up to my kind of former government colleagues to describe more, but, you know, <laughs> I think, um, you know, maybe some of the other panels have had experience in other sectors, but I think one of the interesting things to mitigate some of this is what I'm seeing is, 
um, there's actually a feedback loop now into government and to other places by taking the data that's been made um, available, but also collecting and crowdsourcing more information to augment that and make that stronger. And so hopefully eventually over time, you know, those, those crowdsourcing efforts will become much more sophisticated so as to approximate or make better, you know, the, the, that view of, of the data as a whole. So it's a, it's a different way of answering your question. Mm. Um, but I think that's something else to watch here in terms of disruption is people who are taking, you know, for example, there's a company, there's lots of companies working with the FDA. One of them is Medwatcher. And they're taking the adverse events um, reported to the FDA, but they're also collecting that from you know, from the crowd, so to speak, from the community. And that's augmenting that information. And so I think using, looking at those where there's this dual purpose, where there's a win-win for the community, win-win for the, for the company, and then a win for the government here, I mean, I think that makes a much stronger proposition for keeping this data um, open and available, such that the floodgates are already open. So it's an interesting word, available. Did you want to speak to that briefly, Sasha? I yeah, can see you poised. Yes. So too often, I think that we crowdsource data collection where government has failed in its primary role to act in the best interests of the general public. And I'll give you a great example of this. So Form 477 data at the Federal Communications Commission. No one knows what this means, but really what it is is it's we collect as a government data around where broadband connectivity exists and its costs, and then we don't make that available. And the reason why we don't make that available is because the telcos have argued that the cost of broadband connectivity, i.e. what they advertise general, to the general public in like all those flyers and advertisements that you get every day, is proprietary information. And because of that, we actually have no way to actually meaningfully analyze everything from what's being redlined to where broadband connectivity is and is not. And to compound that, we then spent $350 million out of the broadband stimulus fund to recreate a national broadband map that wouldn't collect certain key information such that now, on top of that, we have to crowdsource to create an accurate broadband map. And so for years, we've been telling the FCC, hey, that data that you already collect about publicly available information, make that publicly available. It seems so simple, and yet we are still battling this out with the Federal Communications Commission. It's just one example. It's one example that costs hundreds of millions of dollars and that keeps vital information, the cost of connectivity, out of the hands of consumers all across the country. And I think you could look in almost any sector and see that same dynamic at play. So this is actually a good jump off point uh, for forms. If there is a form number, number, number in Washington, that can be turned into data. And one of the kind of the great uh, uh, rifts that Katie Stanton, who used to work in government, came out of Google and now is back at Twitter, talked about moving from a form for that to an app for that. You can only do that if the underlying data is released. You can only do that if there's existing political will to push it out. Um, if you look at what it's taken to get some of those kinds of data uh, actually pushed out in a machine readable format, though, it's often involved lawsuits. It's involved people uh, acting as basically uh, as civic activists, right, who are putting data on the web, often at legal risks to themselves. Carl Malamud, if you're watching, uh, if you look at public.resource.org, has been doing this for years. He's responsible more than anyone else for putting the Edgar database from the SEC online. That's what this looked like. And just as a historical note, this, the cost for the servers came from the then CEO of Novell, who then went on to become the chairman of Google, right? It's a combination of a public and private partnership that put that on. Now, Form 990 data, which is the tax filings from nonprofits, is a big fight between IRS and Carl Malamud. He's also fighting to put open standards on the internet. That's what this actually looks like in practice where someone is fighting over putting forms because there's political juice behind them. So Mike, data and political juice. Um, I, I'm not worried about getting into a uh, into with you because you're a New Yorker and you've got you know press down there that'll eat you alive, almost like London, but not quite. <laughs> so um, there are big fights in New York about data. There, there are probably are always going to be because it's New York and people mix it up. But there's also real power involved. Um, can you talk about what it took 
for you to shake loose data from various places and the arguments you used to do it and then what the costs were involved because people have sometimes suggested that this is free and you and I know that's not true. I mean, the cost aside from the fact that I've put on 30 pounds and gone bald in the last four <laughs> years. Um, <laughs> that's sure a cost. You can blame open data for that, Mike. <laughs> but no, it's so it, you're absolutely right. There's, but it's, it's, a, it's a melange of actors, right? So you have, um, by the way, I didn't know that about Edgar. In my old life, I was, did financial crime. And uh, that thing's a real public service. That's right. Um, <laughs> 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 nothing that made me enough to not have to work. Um, uh, so it's kind of a combination of things. One of those things is, is you have this community out there that seeks information. Now, I didn't know anything about that when I first took the job. I was, I was brought in as a logistician. So as you start, uh, one of the biggest things that mattered in New York City to our activist community was something called Pluto, which is so perfectly governmentally acronymy. I can't even tell you what the what it actually stands for, but it's like it's a tax lot map, right? And that tax lot map, I know about it because it became extremely mission critical for us to be able to take our intelligence and attach it to locations. And the and the the Rosetta Stone for the city was you know built in large part off Pluto. Now people have you know the city charged for Pluto, it charged a low amount, but it, you know they they charge for it, uh, and they did it for years. Uh, and it was, and by the city, I mean the Department of City Planning. The Department of City Planning has a division that basically spends a lot of sweat equity upkeeping Pluto. Um, they made a total of 80 grand a year out of it. Now that's 80 grand out of a budget for the city of roughly 60 billion, right? So it's nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm spending probably 80 grand right now, <laughs> but the in in city dollars. But the the fact of the matter is that for them, that was a lot of labor, right? I didn't know anything about it until somebody, I didn't know anything that the, about the fact that it wasn't free, because I'm in the government, it was free to me, um, until somebody finally raised it to me when I had been elevated to the chief analytics officer role, which also gave me responsibility for the city's open data portal. And at that point, then I started hearing, oh, when are you going to get Pluto out? And I was like, what the <laughs> it's already out. You know, they, they sell it for like 500 bucks. You know, go ahead and whatever. And then they were like, no, it should be free. So I made a couple of phone calls, and then out it went. Right? There was a slight fight. And by that fight, I mean there were city lawyers, I think, that had litigated the issue. And the way it went out was we were, as what we usually do, we we're extremely pragmatic about it. They, it doesn't go out on the city's open data page because they, you know, the law department spent a lot of time saying this is not open data. And you know what? They're right. It's data product. Right? So, because what it is is an algorithm that has a bunch of different sources of information together about the tax lot. Right? So, what it went out for free on Department of City Planning's page, which I'm fine with. It's out, you know? Like, the letter of the law didn't actually mandate that Pluto be called open data, even though it's extremely important to understand all the other data that's out in New York City. So if the lawyers were, were okay with us putting it out for free on DCP's page, fine. So the lesson, as usual, is to ask your counsel, how do I do this, not whether you can do this? Right. And, and you know, I am a lawyer. Uh, and which is, I'm a recovering lawyer. And the, the lawyers most of the time are actually your biggest challenge, not the politicians and not the real estate industry in New York, which is our version of like the military industrial complex. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the lawyers. And the lawyers, it's not because they're evil. It's because they're terrified of getting sued, and rightly so. We get sued constantly. So what they're basically trying to do is make sure that we don't get sued. So every question is like, oh, we'll put this out for, oh, we're going to get sued, you know. You're going to get sued anyway. We're so. gonna get, well, that's my argument, right? And, and, and I'm not shy of court. So right. what we ended up doing was kind of saying to them, get me from A to B. I don't want to hear that we can't do B because we're going to get sued. Right. I think that's the definition of disruptive data. I mean, if you're going to put data out there, most likely you will, someone will be upset or you will get sued, and that's how, how we get things started, right? A lot of times you don't just put something out and everyone's happy about it. There are always stakeholders who don't like it. Like take, for example, Yelp. They now, on their webpage, when you look up restaurants, uh, 
of recommendations they have on there, how is that restaurant rated in terms of uh, health violations? And they give you the violations and they give you the health rating. I'm sure the restaurants aren't very pleased with that, especially if they're towards the bottom of the list, but it's amazing data to have for consumers, right? So, or take non-disclosure states, and of course I have to bring up a real estate example, but um, you know, there are, there are places like Texas who don't tell you how much a house sold for officially. Every other state or every other disclosure state will tell you how much a house sold for, but Texas will tell you what the mortgage on the house was, but not how much the house actually sold for. So it's really bizarre, and of course some people like this and other people don't like, and I feel like this happens all the time in data that um, when you put something out, some stakeholders will be happy and others won't, and that's what happens with disruptive data, or that's how we thrive, and that's how we push the, the process forward. So, right? so it is a political will issue, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you overcome these arguments right. because at the end of the day if it's legal to do it that's all I care about give me the end. am I is it legal for us to do X or Y right and if it is then I'm willing to leverage the power of the City Hall email address <laughs> to so, to get it out is it legal know? to release a health inspection data in the city of New York so that it can be ingested by Yelp because let's be clear that health inspection data that's coming from cities now that they're trying to standardize that it already is already out there it's out all right it's so been out for a while and the restaurants were not happy hmm. you know they were very unhappy uh, and and we don't want to dismiss that, right? Like there's a there's a balancing of equities here. Restaurants, there's twenty some odd thousand of them. That's twenty some odd thousand small businesses for the most part. You know, the ones who actually have the best health grades are like you know Subway and McDonald's and you know the chains, because they have the overhead to go in and do whatever it is they need to do to make the place you know spotless, mm -hmm. right? The ones that actually get in the most trouble are the mom and pops. And that actually holds for most places. The pharmacies that get in the most trouble are the mom and pops. These are a lot of places that just don't have the overhead, right, to live up to the regulatory standards. And so when we're talking about, you know, oh, they're going to get upset, I, I mean, these are, these are small business people that we don't want to dismiss. They generate most of our job growth in, in New York City. So let's talk a little bit about who gets upset. Zillow's gotten into the you know, news in some directions here because um, you've done what often uh, data consumers and presenters uh, uh, do in these ecosystems and can extrapolate on all these areas, which is to say, make something that was formerly tacit quite public. Uh, in this case, I'm thinking about um, uh, when foreclosures pop up. Now, previously in the real estate market, only people who were in the market, right, the brokers, people going back and forth uh, between the listings, they knew about it, but the market didn't. And you all got some of that data and you put it on the internet. And now people can see when a house gets foreclosed upon and act upon it. Now, there are people who are uh, social justice advocates who felt like that was a bad use of open data. Um, you all, however, were in using it to improve your product and you know, improve something that some of your users might have wanted. Um, what kind of pushback did you receive over that? And w did people try to uh, you know, close down or obfuscate the data that you were using for that part of the product? You know, it's, uh, that's a great question. I, I feel like we've actually had to cross that, that threshold with a lot of data products what we put out. I mean, when we first started putting out this estimate, I'm sure some of you out there hate yours estimate too, um, people were like, oh my God, take it off. And the same with foreclosure data. There were certainly uh, parties out there that said, take it off. But the fact is, it's already out there. It's already public data. You can look up if someone is uh, past due on their mortgage payment or has started the foreclosure process. It's actually just kind of tough to find. And investors do this all the time. They go and they find out you know, what homes are foreclosed on, then they do research on that home, and then they try to bid for, for it on the court steps to try to actually get it at a really cheap price. We thought, hey, wouldn't it be grand if we made this data available to consumers who oftentimes don't know where to find this data so they can be competitive together with the investors and actually find out this this um, uh, data themselves and then buy a foreclosed home. And, uh, you know, some people didn't like it and other people did like it. So it's, I mean, it's, we are careful about how we display it on Zillow and we, we take great precautions. Um, if someone contacts us and says, please take this down, it's incorrect data, we do so. Uh, so we, we are very, uh, very conscious of that. And I think that brings up a good point that, 
um, it's really important to have that back and forth so that you know you inform consumers and you don't just say here's the data and do with it what you want but you explain to them what it means and if it's wrong you address that issue and you take it down um, so we try to do the best uh, we can there but it's also been really interesting because that's actually created a whole lot of uh, value to other people too which kind of goes along with today's theme um, where then company, companies popped up that said, now that this is really available to consumers and they're getting more and more into this, and I think you know, 2012, 2013 were years in the real estate market where everyone was really hyped up on buying foreclosures and, and, and flipping them or uh, just investing in them, turning them into rentals. Um, but it's really hard to kind of find out you aren't actually allowed to walk through a, a foreclosed home before buying at auction. So it's really tough to kind of see what the house looks like on the inside. And, and you have to make sure you know uh, what sort of back taxes are on that house. So it's, it's, it's you know, these companies popped up that said, hey, I've done this, you know, a gazillion one times. Let me help you. You just have to pay me a flat fee or not flat, depending on the service they're providing. And I will guide you through this not so uh, straightforward process of buying a foreclosed home. Um, or an REO or at ho uh, home at auction. And, uh, and, you know, we created value with that. The consumer was happy because they had someone to help them through this process. And certainly companies made money off of it. So it's, it's one of those examples where data got pushed through and it actually helped people make better decisions and created some value along the way. So this future where these uh, kinds of conflicts are happening is going to get more intense. Uh, if you look back at the past year, you can see two examples that should be instructive. Um, one is the uh, gun data map. Who remembers that in, uh, in New York? Now, this is up, these are public records. These are handgun permits from New York State that a paper then mapped out. Now, that probably made a big mistake, and I think an ethical one, in putting names and addresses on that, which made people searchable in a way that they weren't before and uh, increased personal risk for them if they were of interest to somebody else. Now, what subsequently happened is New York State changed its law and said this kind of thing shouldn't be available under FOIA to a media organization. That's a bad outcome for all the media in New York State in terms of restricting access to something that was previously public, but there was a use of it that created such a public furor that it caused in a shift in the actual legal underpinnings under which the public had a right to access something. Um, mugshots have become, I think, a locus point for this as well, another kind of public record that often media think has public interest value. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are sites that emerge which monetize them, speaking of the economic value of open data, such that they then effectively held someone over a barrel to pay to get it taken down from the mugshot site, which often ranked very high in search. Now, speaking of the ecosystem, Google adjusted its algorithm and said, we're not going to list your image high if you search for a name from one of these sites anymore, which changes the economic value creation from that standpoint. But we can look at those two examples and see that multiple actors might use public records in a way that weren't anticipated. And then there needs to be some combination of media, NGOs, tech companies, which wield enormous power as processors, to change the dynamic for people who didn't have power in that situation which is to say people whose information was described. Now, that's a major concern around health data. Um, the mo so-called mosaic effect goes into you know, uh, this discussion. Can you speak to some of um, the tensions around how you released health data and the consequences of doing it badly um, in terms of HHS's approach? And, yeah. and Merck as well, because you all have yeah. proprietary I, I, you things. know, Everybody I've spoken to, all of my, my colleagues, whether it's public sector or private sector, I mean, this is really one of the, the topmost things on their mind is this exact issue. And so it's always at the forefront of any decision that's made, no matter what you're doing, um, whether you're an academic, you're in the private sector, public sector. And so I, I think healthcare in some ways um, has been um, very careful about what types of data people are releasing and how they're using that. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's some you know, good examples of this. And you know, when you know, we launched uh, you know, the, the open data plan for, from HHS, and how, when we started there, we called it the Community Health Data Initiative. That's how it started. And that was because we were releasing data about communities as opposed to individuals. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the type of data you're talking about and can you have that mosaic effect at the community level. You can still have it at the community level, but it's a much safer way to do that. And I think now by you know releasing more data, you also know um, who the actors are in the ecosystem because people are you know coming forward and talking about that. Um, and so I, I think in healthcare, it's always gonna be a huge issue, but it's one of those um, tensions that, that's never gonna go away. 
Um, and I think it depends on what is the intention of, of what you're you're using that data for. So I mean, I think it's it's a huge it's a huge issue going forward. Um, but but I think uh, what's unfortunate is um, that it is treated evenly across the entire set of actors who use this data. And so let me give you a really quick example of that pushback and tying into Mike's point about political will. Um, you know, back in, in 2006, um, we had the largest change to healthcare in this country uh, since Medicare, which was the launch of, of Medicare Part D. And all of a sudden we had data on 25 million Americans overnight. It took us three years to get that data out to researchers and to people inside the agency at CMS. So the political will at the time and the lawyers at the time, the staff inside of CMS, I was one of them at the time, the interpretation was that we ourselves could not look at that data for public health reasons. And so I think that, you know, while we're talking about, you know, the, the value of the economy here, I think that the research community, the academic community has got pa painted in the same light as all of the other actors in the ecosystem. And I think that's really unfortunate. And I think that it'd be, um, it kind of behooves people in this community to talk more about researchers getting access to more specialized types of data, because ultimately that fuels the downstream effects of what some businesses can use to you know, power off the data that they're getting. And so I think that's another really interesting example of pushback there and being treated, you know, kind of the same as anybody else who would come in, you know, if you were a pharmaceutical company or, or a, an insurer coming in to get the data versus an academic researcher. And I think that's where we need to get this discussion much more sophisticated. And we're still in the very early days of how to deal with some of these privacy issues and who should it apply, apply to. Thank you for that. Uh, so one of the things that this government shutdown taught the nation all of a sudden is that government data can get turned off. Uh, lo and behold, data.gov went down. The census API got turned off. Uh, that changed, I think, the context for the discussions around these areas. It also, I think, um, showed people where businesses did or did not need that data. If you can turn something off and no one squawks, what does that tell you? So um, there are two things that I, that I think took away from that. One is that having um, immediate access to data was not enough of an economic impact within those three weeks, except for perhaps the BLS data. That was the one data set, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the jobs numbers that I saw most journalists kvetch about because they didn't know what to do with themselves on a Friday where they were supposed to come out. Um, and so they're, you know, kind of speculation, wasn't, wasn't sure what to, what to do. Now, of course, that's a great example of economic value creation. People are then making decisions for their businesses, for other things, um, that all of a sudden don't have an indicator to include. Um, Zillow uses census data, though, right? How often do you crawl it? What kind of impact would a shutdown have upon you if it were protracted or if census decided that, um, for whatever reason, commercial entities weren't supposed to have it? So we, we actually noticed. We couldn't download our usual data sets that we usually download. Um, but I mean, for us it was okay. We, we download it for research purposes. So instead of going out that week, we pushed our report back two weeks and had to wait for the data to become available again so we could download it. Um, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't great, but it was all right. To me, actually, government data is incredibly reliable. And I don't, I think it's, <coughs> It comes up a lot more because everyone was talking about the government shutdown and, and therefore it was a very heated discussion that this data wasn't available anymore. But if you think about it, this happens all the time, right? This is a, a few, you know, cloud servers go down and uh, disrupt businesses. So to me, government data actually is extremely reliable. I know it, you know. Friday of this month, mm -hmm. the jobs numbers will come out or I know that this will happen unless a government shutdown, let's let's be honest, doesn't happen all that ho often. And uh, Here's hoping. Yeah. I'm, I'm the Senate just made a budget here. deal, so theoretically a year. You know. That's right. Um, so hopefully it won't happen too often. Um, but you, you know what I mean? I think it's, it's usually that's really reliable data. Other data I don't consider as reliable. So while it had an impact on us, I, I agree with you, three weeks wasn't enough to really make us wince too much about mm -hmm. it. So one of the things that comes up in my discussions with entrepreneurs is this issue, right? So wait a second, if they can take this offline, how do I base my business upon this? Um, you know, how can I, uh, you know, really adopt, deal with that risk? And if we're talking about the economic side, not the accountability and transparency side, not this, the, the services side, although that's clearly very important too if you take something offline. Um, how could you, as an entrepreneur, can you do that? Um, do you need a service level agreement? you know, to some extent. Now, um, New York City has got the, the big apps challenge. You all are trying to take this approach of convening the city entrepreneurs, tapping into your tech sector to say, come use our stuff. 
What kind of uh, you know guarantees or agreements do you put out there as guy in charge of that portal that will keep making this stuff available to you, even if your business ticks someone off and they want you shut down, or even if there are costs of you know we discover in cleaning up and providing this to you that we're not sure if we're balanced by the value creation yet because you know you're still getting going. So as a threshold matter, New York never shuts down. So um, we're not the feds. And I say that with a measure of pride. But the, the reality is there's a number of interlocking reliances on this information that will make that true. There are certainly instances where our website has gone down. I know it goes down on a regular basis overnight for maintenance, right? And we post that. Um, it's not a 24-hour operation yet. There are parts of it that are becoming 24-hour as we, the government, start to rely on some of that data. The, t the Taxi and Limousine Commission... Uh, runs a lot of their license vetting now off of our open data portal, which, you know, is going to end up saving us a ton of money. Um, it's smart, but that also means we're now converting something that was sort of seen as a hobby, right, or as, okay, I guess we have to do this, right, to a business reliance tool. And if we're conducting government business off of our open data portal, then it'll get what it needs to be a 24-hour operation. And then finally, the more businesses that are out there that are using it, will also form a powerful enough constituency to mandate that the resources be allocated so that it remain a 24-7 operation, right? So it's not just, there's no silver bullets, just like with anything, there's no silver bullets with this stuff. It's the more I can make, the more we can make the, the ecosystem of the work gets thrown out, I think it's a good one, right? Because it's, it's really true. There's a lot of interconnectedness out there. Um, so the, the business part of using open data, if we can, the more we can incent them to grow, the more our open data portal becomes reliable, the more government relies on open data, the more it becomes, uh, the more reliable it becomes. Now, uh, one of the areas where NYC.gov got crunched was before Hurricane Sandy. Okay. Um, can you speak to the role that, op that releasing open data about the evacuation map or flooding zones played in getting that out to the public when that website went down? So NYC Gov, so you, you, what you're watching actually during the last dozen years of the Bloomberg administration is a convergence over our information approaches, technology approaches, operations approaches. Um, over time, right, they are starting to converge. Now, NYC Gov is not, was not actually considered and is still not considered open data, right? It's information impartment to the public. So technologists uh, uh, might disagree with you on that. Yeah, I'm sure they would. They'll, but they'll they scrape would, those pages and make them into data. I, 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 go nuts, you know. I mean, we want them to, but the, <laughs> but I'm talking about inside government. How are we dealing with this? So inside New York City government, it wasn't considered that. It was considered our way for you know people to come in. Open the open data portal has been viewed, and this is sort of the danger of co of, of constantly focusing on open data as a data issue. Is it's it's sort of seen, or it was seen until about a year ago, as by primarily like a term of art. Okay, it's data. It's ones and zeros. It's in a CSV. It goes on the open data portal, right? NYC.gov is more like insight about where to go, what to do, who to call, right, um, if you're going to do whatever. We're starting to see those things come together, right? So now, because what Sandy taught us, Sandy taught us a lot, <laughs> but one of the things that Sandy taught us was that NYC.gov needs to also be a 24-7 operation, and it needs to be more aligned with how we view open information in the government, right? So I think we learned, I learned a great lesson. I, we all learned a great lesson from it. I mean, Rachel Howard is who's our uh, chief digital officer, is the business owner for NYC Gov. And she really spearheaded this, this, um, this streamlining and making more robust, not only the NYC Gov, but also how we're leveraging you know, social media and other outlets to let, us, to let the citizenry know where to go as the waters were rising. And I, I think what you're really seeing, what Sandy, what, things like Sandy, what they're, what they're really useful for, if such a thing can be applied to a catastrophic storm, is that it really crystallizes very quickly where we're not doing a good job of aligning all of our efforts in a single area. And one of those was information. So the, uh, the story there, if you haven't looked it up, is um, the WNYC, which is New York City's NPR news station. I've got to drop down my baritone all of a sudden talking about them. They took open data from um, New York City's portal about the evacuation map and flooding zones and put it onto a map. And that map reached 10 times as many people 
as it would have if it had been sitting on NYC.gov, which, by the way, was getting hammered because people are trying to get onto it to see what was going on. Now, unfortunately, New York City has got some of the same scalability problems with its data center that certain federal websites do. And uh, we can talk about cloud and scaling in a different conversation. Um, and as a result, um, the release of that data actually got information onto the phones and tablets and devices of New Yorkers who needed it in the moment. Um, and it's a great opportunity to jump off to the conversation that 21st century government needs to have, which is to start thinking about web services, not websites. Everyone wants to talk about a shiny new website and not as much about the underlying data for it. Um, this is something that, you know, you guys are going to get beat up for under de Blasio if you don't release that crime data. Um, I'm gone in two weeks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not getting beat up by anybody. Wh whoever, wh whoever follows you, right, because releasing a map without releasing the underlying data is no longer sufficient anymore. It's just not. So I think we have, uh, uh, what, four minutes? So uh, I'm going to give each one of you an opportunity to think a little bit bigger about where we're going, because you all have perspective in the space. You've all been in the trenches. You've dealt with upset users. You've dealt with data owners. You've dealt with format challenges. You've dealt with politics. Um, what are the biggest successes and challenges in the space? And how will politics and power play a role in future outcomes? What worries you or excites you the most? I'll give you a shot first and then move on down. Really, Alex, four minutes for that one? Uh, no, <laughs> actually, each one of you get one. OK, that makes more sense. Um, so I think uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be in this space. I think data uh, wants to be free, or if I were to say that correctly, data want to be free, which sounds oh. really weird. Um, and it's going to be free. And I think we're, we're, we're going to evolve in, in this fr on this front, and we'll, we'll experience this tug of war where some people like it, some people don't, but eventually data will become free. And uh, I think business models that are, that are based on monetizing data itself will probably become antiquated at some point. We see more and more businesses pop up that make data freely available and don't monetize the data, but monetize, say, a marketplace. Much like Zillow, we don't charge consumers. We get our money through advertising. And so I think more and more of this will, will happen. And I think it's a good thing. You create transparency, and you allow um, consumers to better educate themselves. You're spreading more knowledge, and that's always a good thing. Now, what worries me is we do, of course, have to have some sort of structure around this. We need to make sure privacy is in place. We need to make sure uh, no stakeholders are unduly hurt. Uh, and, and so there is certainly a role for government to be involved to structure this release of data. Um, we just have to be really careful that there's no one out there that says, this data is useful, this data isn't useful, because there are always going to be people that find all sorts of data useful. So let's, uh, let's keep that in mind and make as much data available as possible, and, and people will find some use for it. And Zillow will, too. And, and we will, too, trust <laughs> <Yeah>. me, yes. <laughs> Mike? Um, I think the thing I'm... So, so what I wish for my successor, if there is one, um, is that they continue to democratize it. And by, democ by democratize the way we use our data. And by, and by that I mean not just, you know, pushing it out to the public, which I think is great, but, end, you know, it ends up being like this narrow part of the public. Um, I think, I, so it's, what, what it, by democratize, we need to make it more insightful for people. I, that thing you mentioned by, by WMYC, that thing was awesome. Yeah. That was a great map. They did a great job. That was useful. We steered people towards it, you know, as, uh, as our own servers got overloaded. Um, that was good stuff. I'd like to see more of that. The, the thing I'm most concerned about, I think, is what I'm concerned about in any job, right? It's bad managers. Um, I think uh, these aren't technology challenges. These aren't legal challenges. These are cultural and political challenges, and those are only resolved by decisive and inform intelligent leadership. And um, one bad manager can muck up 10,000. Uh, employees, you know, or citizens. So I, I think that's that. If if I had a large concern, and it's, it's a concern that I would have over any enterprise, it's that we just the managers aren't up to the challenge. It's a challenge throughout government. I think we can say, Sasha. I think open data is a normative question for civil society, hmm. and by that, what I mean is how we use this how we allow it to be used is an open question that we haven't even begun to address. Mm -hmm. And what I see is not a positive future, but one where 
actuarial redlining and empirical discrimination based upon profile analysis replaces what is currently illegal business practice today. We are heading in that direction. And the problem that I see is that most of the key decision makers lack any semblance of technical acumen. That this panel here represents a good portion of the open data acumen available in DC today. <laughs> and that's a problem. I'm in New York. And I'm in Seattle, so <laughs> it's a real problem. So tom tomorrow we're going to lose like a good percentage of our technical acumen when they all go up. But no, seriously though, this is a real problem because the questions aren't even being asked in these spaces of how do we balance this? How do we protect people? How do we ensure that this positive potential future isn't undermined by some Faustian bargain we didn't even realize we had made, that completely undermines, for certain constituencies especially, the positive outcomes that open data make possible. I can't be as poetic as that, but, um, but definitely echo, uh, you know, I think what, what everybody has said, I'm really concerned about some of the technical acumen as well as the leadership pieces. On the positive side, I think the biggest success has been there's been an enormous change in culture um, in in the communities and you know that are pushing open data at least you know in DC and, and other places across the world. And there are real assets and products in place now um, that will hopefully drive that forward. So it's not just about culture and leadership and policy, but there's real product that's there. So I think that's been to me kind of the enormous success. Um, that that will hopefully keep this this all going. Um, the part that I'm, I'm enormously concerned about, besides what was already mentioned, is um, you know when will uh, the open data community no longer be niche just to the people who know and talk about open data, but it starts to affect the people who are traditionalists in whatever sector you're in. And so I think you know in healthcare in particular, um, where that will be enormously important is not people who are just building businesses and niche businesses and who aren't doing it for you know um, certain public health uh, reasons, but when p the traditionalists who are crafting and making policy, when they start to um, uh, commingle and um, work together with people in the op open data ecosystem. Because at some point, there will be dissonance between what people will be finding from using open data and what the traditional policymakers are using to make policy. And I think having that feedback in um, is a big concern of mine, is when will the traditionals basically get on board? Because they're not there yet. So there's a phrase uh, that's commonly attributed to Francis Bacon, usually comes up though in the context of a fellow named Thomas Hobbes, uh, who's uh, one of the Enlightenment philosophers uh, that I think the founding father we heard about, Thomas Jefferson, read um, as they put together the constructs that underpin how we think about democracy in the United States. Uh, and <coughs> it's scientia potentia est. It's knowledge is power. Now, I don't know um, if datum uh, translates in quite the same way. Because there's all of these steps that you take to go from raw data to information to knowledge and then to that really precious thing, which is wisdom. Um, and wisdom and knowledge have real value in society. Um, that is where the economics come from uh, around this space, if you have something in scarcity. Um, and that is, I, you know, it, if you look through this whole chain of, of data being released, that's where you actually can get into uh, somebody's life in a very meaningful way, help them in a meaningful way, or destroy them in a meaningful way. If we look at where redlining um, might move in the 21st century. If you look at where uh, data wasn't shut off, however, though, in the shutdown, uh, weather data, global positioning system data, um, you can see where certain kinds of knowledge that are being given to people in the palms of their hands where and when they need it um, is now woven into the fabric of daily life. Uh, and that if you look at all these different sectors, you can see where a similar kind of map for an endeavor might grow up that placed you as a little glowing, glowing blue dot upon it, um, that helps you trace not only where other people are within it, but the uh, mileposts, the traffic issues, um, the uh, kinds of decisions that you need to make at that time. The question of whether that kind of future evolves or something more dystopian, I think is the one that governments and NGOs and media and everyone else who's involved in the space are going to have to work together to grapple with and make better rules around. 
Um, I'm really, uh, I think, heartened to see them emerging more into the public policy debate because, as you said, this has often been a smaller group of people. But the fact is, is that these kinds of releases affect everybody. And uh, if you look at the best versions of open data releases, they're the ones that make their ways into the hands of citizens using the interfaces they already use on a daily basis. If you Google Aspirin, you're going to see NIH data in those search results. You'll see also economic development indicators from the World Bank because they've released them into the place where citizens are already looking. So the question now is who will be those kinds of information brokers who ingest data in the 21st century? Some of them will be existing, some of them will be new. Um, I'm sure that uh, some of these people here will be involved in them, uh, in advising them, maybe starting something up. I don't know what you're doing after this, Mike. Um, but uh, I'm certainly hopeful that New America will continue to put focus upon this. I know that McKinsey will continue to follow up. Um, and it's my hope that everyone here and everyone listening online also stays engaged in the conversation um, because it actually does matter. People in government really do need to hear from you. So uh, thanks for inviting me here. Thanks to everyone here. Thanks to everyone online. Keep the conversation going.